is approval of the minutes of the March 30th meeting. And I just have one uh, little edit in the interested parties in attendance section. Andy Lanier's got an extra I in his last name there. Okay. The second one can go away. Anybody else have edits to the minutes? Is there a motion to approve? So move. Is there a second? I'll second. Second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, uh, member updates. So I have two things. One, you all should have received via email an invitation to the Sea Otter Symposium, which is scheduled for October 10. P information uh, that was attached to that email. So if you're interested in attending, uh, please respond to Bob's email about that. Uh, and I am planning to attend that. Um, and then uh, just so everybody knows, I am planning to attend the Oregon Coastal Economic Summit in August. It's on the 22nd and 23rd in Lincoln City this year. The whole first day is uh, devoted to a discussion about carbon reduction. Uh, given that it's likely to be a very hot topic during the legislative session. So there are a number of panels. It is a by invitation only event and it usually uh, sells out yeah, every year. Um, and we'll uh, include uh, Anybody else local, uh, state and federal elected officials, uh, among others, uh, economic development types. The second day is uh, focused education. on education, uh, since that is also expected to be a hot topic during the legislative session. And I understand that running simultaneously will be some discussion about marijuana. Is that There's two or three discussions. Yeah. One's on marijuana. One is on um, building codes and uh, their interactions with cities and other kinds of things. It's been a big conversation lately. Uh, I think there may be a couple other local ones, but yes. Yeah. So uh, interesting agenda for us, the carbon reduction piece, and uh, Jack Barth and I think a couple others will be talking about ocean in the so context of yeah. carbon reduction. So um, thought I'd just let you know about that. Anybody else have uh, updates, things they've attended or planning to attend or know about that we should know about? I will say a couple of us went, the Penware had their big conference, um, Pacific Northwest Economic Region in Spokane last week. And on their agenda was the Columbia River Treaty and the impacts of the dams on the environment. So there was a tour to Grand Coulee, um, which at least one of our other members and I went to, um, and, and an explanation of what's going on. And then a two day bus tour from Spokane up to Arrowhead Lakes, which are up in the Canadian portion of the dams, and they are the flood reduction parts of the dams. And so they had a lot of conversations with local per people whose flood houses were flooded out when they built the dams back in the 60s, and farms that got inundated, and all of the since then environmental impacts on their land, and they would like to see in the treaty some conversations about less up and down of their reservoirs every year. So 60 and 70 feet differences um, create big, mm -hmm. windy, dusty times and have caused other kinds of problems up there. And so they're trying to figure out are there ways to balance that. And they wanted people who were on the treaty. The two treaty negotiators for each country also had a, some, uh, were at the summit and had a conversation. So, um, and we do have conversations there also about the carbon issues, um, Alberta, has a different way of approaching it and other kinds of things. So it's been, it was a good conference and I appreciate having had the opportunity. I was president, this is my last, the last duties of being president, so <laughs> I have a little more free time now, but um, it's an interesting, it, it was a great conference, an interesting conference. Great, good. Anything else for the good of the order? All right, uh, so land board budget report. So I uh, attended the June land board meeting. We had a request in for a million dollars in general fund uh, for the science trust through the DSL budget that the land board did approve uh, the budget request going forward. Now, it's always interesting because the governor is chair of the land board, but the budget is going to the governor's office now uh, for their process. And it, as you'll remember last time we did this, we didn't make it through the governor's recommended budget uh, process. 
Um, Chris indicated to me before the meeting started that he was feeling a little more optimistic that we actually might because there is quite a bit of uh, conversation about climate change and uh, what we should be doing about that. And so there may be more funding uh, around the climate change issue uh, in the governor's budget. We'll see uh, whether that pans out or not. We won't know until, uh, well, we'll probably know sometime in November or her budget will come out officially December 1st. The, uh, also, the um, 10 year anniversary of the implementation of our um, reserves off the coast is happening um, in 2020, 2021. And everybody had, all the environmental groups and all the others had said, we will let it ride until then, but if we think we need more, that's when we'll start having that conversation. I think there are a lot of people who actually believe that if we don't either add more or have better information about what they are doing, there will be another push. That was, those were ugly wars during the time that they were happening. Um, and I think that will also give an impetus to the governor to fund. Um, I will also put a bill in for $5 million, and I think Dave and I will both be working on that. Um, that gives some impetus to, well, maybe we can sell it for a million, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have a conversation about that as well. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's always, uh, from my uh, observation, been easier to get money if it starts out in the GRB. So, <laughs> That's um, absolutely true. So <laughs> even if we just got a small amount in the GRB, it would be yes. a place to start the discussion yep. during the Ways and Means process. So yep. hopefully um, that will happen. So uh, Matt, I'm going to switch things up here a little bit since Matt's not here yet. Um, uh, let's, Jim, how about let's do your OAH oh. uh, report. Sure. And you have at your spot a, uh, a one pager that um, actually a two pager or two pager front and back right. that um, entitled references to oost in the current version of the OAH coordinating council recommendation to the legislative assembly so Jim if you yeah want the to talk. coordinating council uh, the OAH coordinating council is getting close to a final version of the report uh, and series of recommendations uh, to the legislature. The, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but the, the due date for that is September 15th, and we have another uh, working session tomorrow to go through the last couple of, uh, of major items. And so hopefully we'll be doing the final rewrite here in the next, the next month or so. What I wanted to do is to bring to your attention a couple of places where Boost is specifically called out in um, in the the recommendations that are are going to be going forward. Now we, we still have another at least one more rewrite, so this might change a little bit, but it's it's a fairly simple direct reference to Boost as a non-state uh, agent or a non-agency state entity. Um, that the coordinating council is is cons they're they're serious about trying to encourage funding for OH efforts and research uh, to be coming through boost, and uh, I think that's both reasonable, but also I think it might give a little bit of boost to the the uh, budget request that boost is making to. So if, if there's anything that uh, the trustees here can suggest in terms of maybe adding to, rewriting, um, editing this in any way, uh, my guess right now is that it will go forward in the, in the current wording, but I would be more than happy to take back any recommendations to, uh, to the council over the next couple of uh, things as, as we're writing through this. What kind of comments are you looking for? What, 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 what do you feel like is missing or you'd like to? I'm, I'm comfortable with the way it's written currently, but mm -hmm. I, was, I, I would like the, the trustees here to take a quick look at this. I know it was short notice. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you can, if you have anything over the next week or two, you want to email it to me, that would be fine too. Mm -hmm. 
Jim, I wanted to uh, ask you about Action 5.1.C, facilitate the acquisition of outside sources of funding to meet the state's needs. And did you discuss in your meetings the mechanism for potentially how to do that? No. This, this is one section that we'll be working on tomorrow. I see. Um, so I will, uh, I will reference that. And if there are no other uh, comments relative to Hoost, uh, another not quite related point is that uh, Ocoin has made a verbal request for some funding support any place that they can find it, including us. Um, and they are, their funding, their current funding uh, ends in September and they would they are seeking about uh, $4,000 for a summer intern next summer and about a half, about $500 for an annual meeting that they have been uh, conducting. And so they're looking for any sort of possible funding support for that. Um, Jim, on the very bottom of the page two, ensuring used and similar institutions have institutional frameworks to take in and redistribute outside funds to state priorities. What Do you have any uh, examples of what the similar entities are? Just trying to understand why that wording might have been included. Are there other organizations that have the same kind of institutional no, framework issues that that's, we do? That's a good question, and I, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, might be a more powerful statement for Oost without similar with, entities. Without if that. there are not similar <laughs> exactly. entities, it would be a more direct statement to the reader that mm -hmm. Oost needs the, the framework. But if there are similar entities, maybe they should be called out. Well, that's know. that's one of the issues that I've had uh, throughout this, that there are several <coughs> places where similar terms, almost placeholders, have been plugged in there, mm -hmm. and you don't really know if there are similar entities. Mm -hmm. and what I've been pushing for is that if we do have other examples, then call them out mm -hmm. and not leave it so vague. So I, I suppose it could refer to the non-agency state entities on the front page, like the Global Warming Commission and OPAC and STAC, who really don't have mechanisms to take in outside funding directly to them but um but that's the role really of right Oost, right so mm -hmm. right do that on yeah. right entities behalf um, right Okay, any other comments or questions about this? I, w I would just say I like that. If we just took the rest of it out, um, or if they put another bullet that just says, if there are any other entities, please contact, whatever. Right. Uh, I think it would make us look better, so I agree. That's a comment. Okay. And just a reminder on the O'Coin discussion, so that's the entity that's sort of taking uh, over the housing of all the information about current uh, research and monitoring projects, uh, as well as other information in a centralized place uh, housed at PSU currently, and uh, is, I think, transitioning to the um, uh, Oregon Explorer at right. uh, OSU um, as the, the framework as right. the framework for hosting that uh, over time. So, the the request that they're asking for is uh, each summer they need want an intern who can uh, QA QC the data the information that's been put in there, and then um, to host an annual meeting of all the people who are participating and contributing to um, that. Uh, information network and uh, making sure that it's serving the purposes that uh, it was intended to serve for all of those folks so um, that's the, so um, we were, we had talked about the funding need at the 
last annual meeting, and so they're going to be out searching to try and find. They need a little less than five thousand dollars to do what they um, they want to do on an annual basis, which is pretty inexpensive to maintain that system over time. So. And should we get a pile of money, we might be able to help them out. But we'll see. <laughs> okay, uh, I see Matt is here. So Matt, I'll invite you up. So just uh, before Matt starts, just a little refresher on how we got here. At our last meeting, uh, Christina and I uh, brought back information from our meeting with the Oregon Community Foundation <coughs> about their capacity to receive and distribute funds. Um, to support Deuce's work. And uh, Representative Gomberg's office, at our request, had asked for a, an opinion from Legislative Council about whether we could use an outside entity like OCF to uh, receive and distribute funds. And the answer from LC was, yes, that's feasible under the statute. When we then uh, got the draft agreement from the Oregon Community Foundation and sent it to uh, DOJ for their review, uh, we ran into a bit of a stumbling block. So Matt is here to talk about that today and talk about how we might remedy that um, uh, problem. And just a reminder, the Oregon Community Foundation charges a 2% administrative fee to handle money. If we, we could, easily just drop Oregon Community Foundation and go to some other entity and ask them to serve as a pass-through for us that would probably charge us 10 or 15 percent administrative fee. So the, the benefit of being at OCF is because they are really large in terms of managing their funds, their fee is uh, much lower than anyone else could administer funds for us. But there is an issue in terms of how the decision-making process is laid out through the Oregon Community Foundation agreement, and I have talked with the Oregon Community Foundation staff about their ability to change the language in their draft agreement to accommodate the issue raised by DOJ, and they're unable to do that without violating their operating procedures. So we are in a little bit of a box. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, and he can talk about what the issue is and how we might remedy it and um, I'll turn to our legislators to say uh, we may need a legislative remedy to address this. Thanks. Thank Matt, Holliday. if you could talk into the mic, that would be better. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Chair Holiday, members of the trust, thank you. My name is Matt DeVore. I work with the Oregon Department of Justice, provide general counsel advice to uh, the Department of State Lands and then through that can provide administrative, through Department of State Lands administrative support of the OOST, I can provide general counsel advice to uh, members of the, the, the OOST as a body and, and questions that come up. And Mr. Castelli is distributing a copy of the memo that we just finished on Friday, so I apologize for it being so late, but uh, since the intention was to have this publicly released, it went through a few more layers of review than it typically would have, uh, and it, it took some time for us to get through it all. And I should also start out by saying that I have been in contact with Legislative Council's office, and we haven't been able to connect to um, make sure that our, our advice is not necessarily in alignment, but to, to coordinate our discussions on any of the issues that have been raised. And I feel comfortable in saying that our, our opinions are fairly consistent. Right. Uh, when Legislative Council first looked at this issue, they didn't have the benefit, as I understand it, of the draft agreement from Oregon, uh, OCF uh, and the draft agreement I think has some ambiguities that in my mind raised some red flags that I first addressed with DSL and then put into the, the memo here and I think from a general overview the, the first question I would have is does the OOST want to have OCF acting as uh, an agent that goes out and collects donations on behalf of the OOST and then holds on to them or does the OOST want to have uh, sort of a, a consulting role with the OCF, where the OCF do, goes out and does its own fundraising efforts, has a fund of money that then it can donate to the OOST. And those are two different approaches. Uh, I think that the way the statutes are written up, it clearly indicates that you've got authority to do one approach, but not the other. 
if you want to have the OCF collecting money that is donated to the state, the statutes are fairly clear that those monies need to go into state treasury. If it's if it's collected on behalf of Oost, it needs to be it's state donation and it needs to go into state treasury. Uh, on the other hand, if the OCF wanted to set up its own private fund uh, and collect money, for instance, on ocean science projects in general, without saying that it's directly linked to the Oost, then they could periodically decide to make donations and Oost could be one of the primary recipients. So that's those two approaches, I think, are a general overview of where I saw the agreement initially potentially going, and I don't know what the Oost's intentions are. So I'll leave it at that, and then I could go into more detail here if you would like, but if there is clear direction on which of those paths the Oost wants to go, it might help frame the discussion. So, Matt, <coughs> the, the idea here is that there are organizations like fund, private foundations and businesses and individual donors <coughs> who may be interested in providing money to support the work of Oost, but they want the tax write-off, which they don't get by money going into the state treasury. And OCF is a nonprofit, 501c3. And so by providing the funds to OCF, they get the tax write-off that come, the tax advantage that comes with donating through OCF. And as uh, in, uh, Christina and my discussion with OCF, they have the ability to receive those funds in what they call a donor advised fund. Um, and and they have a number of donor advised funds. So money comes in from a, can come in from a variety of sources. So my question for you is, if, if I went out and asked some business, I'll, I'll use Laura, so she's got a business on the coast. If I went to her and said, would Local Ocean be willing to donate $5,000 to support the Ocean Science Trust, would, because I'm doing the ask, would that money have to go to the state treasury and it could not go to OCF? If the person donating the money believes that they are donating it to the state, I believe it would have to go to state treasury. And if you as an OOST member are asking for the donation on behalf of the OOST, then I, I believe it would be a state donation that would have to go to treasury. On the other hand, if OCF were saying, we've got an ocean science project account and we want donations. Um, the level of partnership and collaboration there that could occur I think has some more flexibility and you as OOST members could help the OCF as it develops its fund, but it would have to be clear that those <coughs> are donations to OCF and not to the state. Does that distinction help? It, it helps, but uh, I think we're still trying to feel our way through this. So if um, in that latter case, if OCF uh, generates money that goes into this fund, they could use it for other purposes than those that OOST would suggest. That's it, correct. And I believe the, the draft, draft, draft agreement as written uh, provides that OCF would seek recommendations from the chair or recommendations from another member of the trust the, the funds are held and owned by OCF and they would have authority to decide what to do with them under this draft agreement. So let me ask this question. You make reference a couple times to the, the phrase consultative, which is not a black and white issue, but rather a continuum. Um, at what point do we cross a line where we are doing more directing, which would be inappropriate, than advising, which was uh, allowed? Under the current statutes, I, I don't believe that the OOST would have authority to have a binding contract with OCF. So it would have to be a voluntary uh, sort of discretionary consultative and not a, uh, the OOST wouldn't have the final authority. If you wanted to move towards that kind of a model, that's where I think the Oregon Parks Foundation has an example in statute that would be more consistent with what you're discussing. Yeah. 
in the, the, the statutes are, I mean, they're, they're really set up to say that donations that come into OOST go into the, the Oregon Ocean Science Fund as part of Treasury. It just doesn't contemplate that there would be this other body holding the money. And I, th I think that's where there's some, some difficulty in, in my office endorsing that plan. So when people donate money to the state, they can sometimes get a tax write off there too. Is that not true? Isn't there a default number? Is that a no? That I don't know. No. Okay. So it's a no. So there are certain um, entities that have a tax exempt. I'm thinking of the cultural trust. Right. Um, School districts. But um, the state does not qualify. Okay. So how do the parks then, how is their group organized? And to follow up on that, I think how was Oregon State Parks Foundation established? That's was right. it established by right. the legislature or was it independent? It was by legislature. Well, in ORS 390.141, which- So the, the last page of the opinion has the Parks Foundation oh. piece in it. Yes, thank you. Uh, that's the statute that's in place now. It looks like it's been in place since 2013. And it allows the Department of Parks and Recreation to enter into a partnership with a private nonprofit organization that will solicit the gifts and donations and then be able to hold those as donations. So it, it, I don't know which came first or how the, the progression of this evolved, but this is the statute in place that allows the current model. Yeah, and it, this, if I remember correctly, the State Parks Foundation pre-existed the, the statute, so they were already in existence and collecting funds as a nonprofit organization but there became an issue over who was directing the use of those funds. And so I think the statute was passed to address that issue. So similar to the problem we're finding now with OCF. Yeah, so, I th so similar language to this, which would say that the Ocean Science Trust could enter into an agreement with a private nonprofit who, who could receive gifts um, for the benefit of OOST would fix the statutory issue that we have currently. Would it allow us to go to the um, OCF? I believe it would. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because, it, it, because they're a private nonprofit organization. Right. And then it would be clear that money could both go to the state treasury and to this, to OCF. As two different alternatives for a person that wants to donate. I believe, I believe that would be possible. Um, and this is something that we'd have to work with legislative council about right. clearly to make okay. sure that it, it meets everybody's needs. But I believe the parks <laughs> model would be a good example <coughs> if you wanted to have OCF collecting and collecting donations on behalf of the OOST. Would it therefore still be okay if uh, individual board members went to solicit saying we have these two options available to you, you could send it direct to the state or you could send it to this foundation which would, it would be okay for members of the board to do that? I believe so. I, I think that in the back of my mind, I, it seems like if money is being donated to OCF instead of to OOST, if, the, yeah, if there's the potential that OCF could then take the money and do something else with it besides donate it to the state, it seems a little bit awkward that mm -hmm. a person would, a, a board member, a trust member would have the choice of which one to recommend. But I, I believe it would be allowed under this model. <coughs> and it seems like the reality is that OCF isn't gonna want to donate these funds beyond what OOST is recommending if we're the ones bringing the funding and creating this donor advice fund. Even though that's possible, highly unlikely that they're gonna just go off and give those monies to some other ocean projects. Right, so in our conversations with them, the review that their board does and their staff does, so suppose we decide we wanna, there's a bunch of money there 
that's been donated for OOS to use, they, there would be a grant process, a grant application process, competition. We would be reviewing those grants under our rules that we adopted to do that. We would then be making a recommendation to OCF for which of those grants that we think should be funded. And OCF reviews the entities that made the application to make sure that they are legally mm -hmm. allowed to receive funds from OCF mm -hmm. and that they are, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, have, uh, a, a account of, they're accountable uh, for the funds and they've got a history of being able to manage funds. Um, so they sort of do a due diligence. They're not looking at should we fund this grant versus that grant. It's more of an administrative type review, I would mm -hmm. describe it. I agree. Um, and they're not, they're not going to fund things that we're not recommending mm -hmm. uh, from my discussion with them. The grant agreement doesn't make that, the, the, the draft yeah. agreement doesn't make that clear. Uh, and we can talk to Diane about whether we can put something in there that really does make that clear. But that's, that's the process that they go through is one of just making sure the, these are legal entities that they have the ability to manage funds. Um. So it sounds like there's a possibility that if, um, if we had a, a f legislative fix similar to Oregon State Parks to set up an Oregon Ocean Science Fund at OCF, that that would allow for a mechanism for us to be able to then uh, raise additional funding for our efforts and have a, a consultative process to be able, as Louise said, to to be able to advise which fund, uh, which grant proposals eventually might uh, fit the criteria of the OOST board. I believe that's correct. It, it would allow the OOST to have a different place to have the money be held rather than with Treasury. And I think you would still need to have a discussion with OCF and some clarification with OCF as to what level of control the OOST has over mm -hmm. distributions. Um, as written, the draft provides that if the fund does not reach $25,000, OCF can rededicate the fund to something, right. to scholarships and grants that are completely mm -hmm. separate from ocean science projects. And that may be something that you would want to look at a little bit more before you recommend donations go to OCF. Yeah, I think some of us are willing to make sure that there's $25,000 <laughs> there, so that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, so there's a political issue here if we're going to go the legislative route, and that is... Uh, whether uh, the legislature is going to be willing to have a hands-off of the money that goes into OCF. You know, the, the way the legislation is originally crafted, the money goes to the state treasury, which gives the legislature the ability to say yay or nay to a budget for oost every biennium. The OCF money would be off of the state budget completely and the legislature would not be able to say yay or nay um, to how those funds are spent because spent because OCF would have that authority to ultimately make those decisions and disperse those funds and I, I've had a conversation with Senator Roblin about this issue and my concern that I don't want OOS to get size, sideways with the legislature if we come in with a legislative concept that's going to create another vehicle for providing funds to OOS. But we're, as I said to you, we're in this box where we're not a 501c3, so folks who want to donate to a 501c3 <coughs> to get the tax advantage can't do that currently, and the state is not providing any funds for us which makes it a little difficult for us to operate. And so uh, the goal here is to provide that alternative vehicle to get funding into us. And I don't know what the comfort level is of um, the legislature about going this direction. I mean, they did it with the Parks Foundation, so we know there's 
a sample out there um, to, to model after. Does, now Parks has a separate group that is their Friends of the Parks, right? Not OCF. They don't use OCF. The, no, right. they use the State Parks Foundation, which is a separate 501c3 gotcha. with its own board of directors and okay. its own decision-making process. But they receive money, but they fund the parks priorities, right. the State yeah. Parks Department priorities. Personally, I believe politically OCF has a good standing in the legislature. Both parties vote with everybody. That okay. almost every one in the legislature has and knows some fund that's over there that's been supportive of different kinds of things they've liked. I mean, I, they, they are pretty good that way. So I, I believe it could work. Uh, I think it can be sold also that <coughs> you're going to have another set of eyes making sure that where the money is being spent is appropriate. Um, that was one of the issues that came up from the very beginning conversations about having a fund at all. Right. Um, so uh, I personally believe it could work. Dave, thoughts and suggestions? Well, <coughs> I, um, I worry about the fact that we're asking for the authority to raise money over there well, we're also asking for money over here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that these two things, I think, is, as you suggest, are going to get crosswise and potentially we could end up with neither of them. Um, I don't know how strong a potential that is, but it's certainly the, something that comes to me. Um, I'm going to jump ahead for just a minute because we're talking about having another set of eyes on the whole process. And am I reading the budget correctly mm -hmm. that we are looking at allocating about over $3 million for reviewing RFPs and monitoring RFPs? So are you, you no, that's no. for the actual <laughs> RFPs themselves. I saw that. That's where <laughs> the funding comes in. <laughs> All right, because I, yeah, I just read it, to, and no. again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I think it's relevant to this conversation. Where it says monitoring RFPs, $2 million. So that's to uh, award monitoring RFPs. So we would get requests for proposals and award money to fund Okay. So we're not talking about spending $2 million to look to keep an eye on no. them. No. No, no, no. It's under grant program. It's no. under grant program. Thank you. No. Yes. Those are adjectives, no. not no. verbs. No. No. <laughs> the other thing I think that is important to keep in mind is a lot of the folks <coughs> who might provide funding to OCF are going to want matching funds, which is where state funds can come into play. So I think there is a direct connection between <laughs> funds that might go into the state treasury uh, helping to get more money going into the OCF fund. No. But. The value of what we're trying to do here is how do we make that either more explicit or clear that value is is that we're building funds by providing matching. Well, I think, yeah, I think clearly we want to use the state funds to leverage other funds. Right. And I, you know, maybe there's a way to, uh, as we're drafting, if we're drafting legislation, to talk about the fact that uh, money in the state treasury uh, can be used to leverage uh, funds that would come into OCF because a, a lot of foundations require some sort of matching funds. Right. They're not going to give you 100%. So the, and, and they're going to want to know, does the state have skin in this game? Mm -hmm. right. This is a state program. Is the state putting funds in before they're going to be willing to support? And the idea is to grow this fund right. to be a much larger fund. And you have to have multiple sources uh, to be able to, to do that. And everybody wants to leverage each other's funds. Right. So, um, so somebody's got to give the, the first tranche of money and uh, to start the ball rolling and getting the leverage and getting some pilot projects funded and to start getting a track record of success. Yeah, the words public-private partnership, is that a positive idea in the legislature? Depends on which one they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Trying to think logistically, you have an RFP that you fund for a hundred thousand dollars, and we say fifty percent of this is going to come from Treasury, and we're going to use fifty percent of our donor advised funds from OCF. Um, 
as far as the way I was kind of trying to read briefly, those funds couldn't really be commingled. Separate payments would have to happen to each of right. the recipients. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And um, is that how it works with parks then also? Because they have straight treasury funds and they have their parks foundation funds, but those don't commingle. I was trying to read the first paragraph, and I don't know if I was understanding correctly of uh, receiving and handling monies in the parks of uh, Section 293-265, that um, it's the duty of the collecting entity to turn over all the money described in this section to the state treasurer. Am I missing something through there? Or? Uh, <coughs> the statute in 293.265 uh, right. is a, a general statute about a state agency's obligations in receiving money. That applies to all state agencies. The next page is the Oregon Parks Foundation statute in 390141. Okay. And that's yes. the one that really lays out the state parks process. I'm like, that part's not helping. <laughs> that's right. Okay, go that's another right, page. That's the part <laughs> yes. That's what got us in trouble in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> And Matt, do you know under the parks model, does money just go from the foundation to the parks department? As I'm reading this, it looks like that's the way it's, but section seven talks about the director entering into an agreement with, which would be the parks foundation. It says he can refuse any gifts. So it sounds like <coughs> the money is coming into parks where it then would become part of their budget and subject to the state process. That's my understanding, but I don't know a lot of details about how they actually implement this statute. Okay. Yeah, I, think I, I would expect helpful. that there is a group of projects that the parks is already working on, and to finish it off, there are resources needed to put a railing, do whatever, and they ask the foundation to finish that off, and that money comes in, and they finish the project. And the parks does a lot of their own work, so right. it would be different than us trying to so if ODF and W were the recipient of, say, abalone funds as per our projects there, could they receive funds from OCF? Directly, yes. 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 Okay. Yes, they could. Yeah. As long as we recommended it. As long as yes. we recommend it, they can receive Yes. We, yeah, OCF can send money to state agencies. Okay. We yes. clarified yeah. that with oh, them, so yes. not an issue. Well, so yeah. Or to a university, right. private or pro public. Right. That's right. They can give to any entity. Right. right. So I did have a clarifying question. We just touched upon this uh, briefly, but uh, for example, if we had a legislative fix and if there was a fund set up at OCF, um, as trust members, wh where are the sideboards for being able to, you know, under ethics rules to be able to um, spread awareness and information about this fund and not fundraise but um, develop partnerships. It, it's going to come back to what the legislature has authorized you to do. So I would look at what the parks model is to say this is what the, um, the members of the trust could do to solicit donations to OCF. My concern is that as the statutes are written now, that would not be allowed by statute. But under the parks model or any alternative language that you come up with to propose, you could explain what it is that you want to have authority to do. And it could include seeking donations to this private nonprofit entity uh, that will be used for ocean science projects. So I, it's it's not a very clear answer because it just depends on what the legislation ultimately says. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful or still too vague? Well, it's a, in some ways it's a bit of a broader question too, uh, not just for OOST board members, but for yeah. other commissioners. Uh, for instance, Oregon State Park Agency um, board <coughs> members. What 
you know, whether they go out and, um, and can solicit funds for the Oregon State Parks Foundation. I, mean, I think that's kind of the sideboards that I would like to be uh, more aware of because it's one thing to go out and talk about boost and talk about projects. It's another thing to go to a private individual who's interested in oceans and recommend that they that there's this other vehicle to get money to ocean science. So yeah. I was just wondering what those sideboards are under Oregon ethics rules. Where you would have two different funds that they could donate to and what you as a news member could recommend with which one they donate to. Is that essentially the, yes. the mm -hmm. dilemma? And I, I, I agree that that is an issue and it's in the back of my mind as something that I'm not sure how to recommend you would reconcile. Um, I don't know if that dilemma comes up with parks or not, but that's something I could look at to see how they've addressed it. I don't believe it would be a violation of the conflict of interest statutes because it doesn't affect you personally in a financial way. Yeah. Uh, but it would it almost be like a duty of loyalty. Are you being disloyal to your, your role as an OOST member if you recommend these funds go to a private entity? I think that the legislature could authorize you to do that in a way that it wouldn't put you in a personal liability. Yeah. Um, and then just determining which which vehicle is the best one to serve the purposes of the OOST is something that the, the OOST or each individual member could decide. Mm -hmm. But if the legislature says you can seek donations to a private nonprofit entity, then it would protect you from liability, I believe. Because the issue would be, if you send it directly to the state, we don't pay 2%, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we get to use all the money. Mm -hmm. If you send it to this other entity, we still get to spend the money, but we have to pay 2%, and you get a de tax deduction. So mm -hmm. those are the issues you have to decide with respect to how your money, what you want to spend your money. And we, as OOS members, mm -hmm. can say, we don't care. Um, we would appreciate either way, but we want to give you the best options with your value, with the value of your money, uh, to make an impact on ocean health. I think that's an excellent recommendation, Senator. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, just a reminder that there is an administrative yes, cost is. to administering that fund, so it's not without right. a fee. Some cost. We pay the state treasurer. Um, Right now, it's ten dollars a month on the five thousand right. dollars minus whatever we pay for ten dollars a month right. for the months month, that's, months that's been there. High. That can get pretty high fast. So. Exactly. Well, and that fee is going to <laughs> increase as we put more money. Right. In, more money goes into the state right? treasury. Oh yeah. Uh, the so fee you wouldn't increases. say the exact if there's no. Exactly. Right. So there is a fee right. that's. There's almost always a fee. Right. People like. <laughs> Nobody manages money for free anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, uh, so it sounds like if we, uh, well, it sounds like it doesn't matter whether we want to use OCF or some other nonprofit, we would still need a legislative fix to do that, yeah. uh, given the current statute, talking about state treasury, but. I think the alternative would be that OCF sets up their own independent fund for ocean science projects and then they decide who distribute it to, and OST, OST can advise them on that. And you could use this agreement as a model, but it would be a non-binding, completely voluntary agreement, and it would have to be clear that they're making donations to OCF and not to OOST. If they're making donations to OOST, it needs to go into the But if we want to set up our own mm -hmm. Oregon State uh, Ocean, uh, Ocean <coughs> Foundation, we could set up that foundation, like the one that was set up for the parks. We could set up a five, a separate five hundred one c three. Five hundred one c three. Yeah, I am. I believe so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, but we still need the same fix legislatively. It, it would yes. need to be. I sh should go back. I believe you could with the correct legislative authorization. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. We're going to the legislature one way or Either the other. Way, it's gonna go, there's a legislative fix needed. Okay. Yeah. Because the. From your perspective, the current statute it, it, that we have is clear on what our responsibilities is that the money goes to the treasury. It's Anything true. else 
would have to take some fix. If it's donated to the state through OOST, it needs to go into the state treasury. Okay. I believe that is okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I had a question uh, going back to Jim's memo. Um, because the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is also a grant making entity, but it is a state agency itself, are they allowed to accept private funds? Because I know they get appropriated like lottery funds as part of their budget, other funds, but do you have any idea, do they ever accept private donations? I, you're asking about OWEB? OWEB, yes. I don't know. No. So I know they get federal funds because it, they, do get federal, they get the Pacific they get Coastal mm -hmm. um, Salmon Recovery Funds from the federal budget. But they I go don't into state, don't they? Those from the federal government give it to the state. Yes, so it right. th but that money goes directly to OWEB to right. fund projects through OWEB. And I, but I don't recall them ever getting private foundation funds or donations, but I know they get federal grants. And they do get a lot of matching grants that would be the private funds, and that may be one way that they're able to bring private funds in is through matching. And I can't remember if they have receipts authority for gifts and donations. Some agencies explicitly do, and I don't know if OWEB is one of those or not. I can't remember. Okay, so it's so it sounds like uh, if we want to utilize a 501c3 model, whether it's an existing one or our own, uh, it will take uh, a legislative uh, some amendments to the statutes to allow us to do that. Uh, we are past the deadline for state agencies to submit legislative concepts. Do you all have a deadline to submit legislative comp uh, concepts from your offices? Do you either September, of you yeah. September is when we have some it. after that because yeah. we get the you priority bills so, right. or whatever. But, but, but free. Yes. September. Okay. So how about uh, I'll work with your offices, your staff, um, to uh, sort of lay out conceptually what we want in a legislative draft. Yeah. And so we, we, it's easy to get a placeholder that would have to do with this right. from either one of our offices. And maybe one okay. from each would be fine okay. <laughs> to begin with. Okay. And then have time to work out with the legislative council what the internal part of that bill looks like. Okay. But it would have to be relating to OOST or something like right. that. Right. Well, I think that if we get that narrow of a related <laughs> clause, yeah. I'd Nobody's be good. Nobody's going to get too excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions or comments or thoughts as we're thinking this through? at some point to have Oregon State Park Foundation give a presentation to us? So or the parks director uh, who sits right. on the board of the Parks Foundation. Right. Um, so we could ask Lisa to come or um, somebody from the Parks Foundation okay. to do that. Yeah, I it think might, that be might be helpful. useful. But in the meantime, in order to meet legislative deadlines, we should probably work on and We have to figure out how this is all worked out because this fair board also has, but the fair board is a strange creature as well. There is also a fair foundation, so I'll have to look and see how they work that out. Separate from the fair board. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, didn't know that. They were in existence long before. They have been out there forever. Oh, okay. You know, fixing up things and doing stuff. And okay. I think we've made a different relationship with them over time, but they, they just are their own little foundation that has been around mm -hmm. for a long, long time working. Okay. To help make. Well, I suppose the Capital Foundation is similar, I suppose, it as a model. They raise funds to do improvements in the Capitol building, so. Yep. Hmm. Okay, so there are several different models out there. Is Capital Foundation in statute? Mm, I, don't I don't know, know the answer I don't to know that if they are. <laughs> okay. I know I'm on it, but I don't know. I mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other questions for Matt while he's here or thoughts? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah, this was really it. helpful.
So next is um, the review and discussion of the pilot projects. And you all should have gotten a one pager that I drafted. And just uh, a, a reminder, a couple things. This list might not, not look exactly like what we talked about. I, in talking to folks, uh, I dropped one of the things that we had talked about, which was <coughs> Uh, beginning to develop baseline data on muscles in talking to ODFW, that was not a very high priority for them. Um, so I didn't even try to develop something around that. Um, you'll also notice that the, um, the Abalone project, uh, which uh, I think was recommended by somebody in the audience, um, so ODFW has a proposal to develop a conservation plan for Abalone. And there are likely to be within that plan some research and monitoring um, actions. So I would suggest that um, this group probably uh, does not want to get involved in the actual planning document itself, drafting the, the planning document, but to fund any research or monitoring that might come out of that plan or be identified in that plan as part of it. The other projects, so the mapping tool, the first one, the mapping tool for uh, fishers. So this is something that came out of the uh, fishermen scientists roundtable discussions uh, that have been going on for a couple of years where there are lots of uh, observations by fishermen when they're out on the ocean and there's not a repository for those to place those observations uh, with location information, what it is they're seeing, and any other information, you know, they may know what the water temperature is, where they are, or whatever information they may have, to put that in a place where it's available for fishermen and scientists to see. You may be able to connect some of those events with data that's being collected at buoys or uh, through monitoring stations. So the goal there is have a place where fishermen um, can um, uh, place those observations. It's something the fishermen have requested uh, at both the first meeting and the second meeting uh, of that uh, fisherman scientist uh, round table. Uh, the second one uh, also, uh, in fact, the first three come out of that round table discussion. Second one was a project that was specifically identified at the uh, last meeting of the round table uh, that there is um, science and research needed on looking at how adult Dungeness crab are responding to hypoxic and acidification events uh, in the ocean. Uh, and uh, we know that there has, have been some crab die-offs uh, in some of the really bad hypoxia events, um, but we don't know exactly how crab are responding in terms of are they moving to different places in the ocean to get away from highly acidic waters, mm -hmm. uh, from those hypoxic waters? And so uh, looking at using some uh, uh, crab pots that have da uh, some um, monitoring, equipment. monitoring equipment on them mm -hmm. to sort of uh, look, how, look at how that's uh, doing. And the numbers, Sarah, uh, just so Shelby doesn't go off the deep end here. I made up these budget numbers. I had no idea what the cost was of doing any of these. They, the budgets had not been developed by the, the group that's working on this yet. So those numbers are placeholder numbers. I, I just was trying to eyeball, you know, if we're developing equipment and putting equipment in a bunch of crab pots, it could get pretty expensive. So that's a higher number than it may need to be. I don't know. And then the next one is looking at, um, the impact of acidification and hypoxia on forage fish, um, which we don't know a whole lot about in terms of how they're responding to what's going out in the ocean. So a couple of, uh, one, economically important, and two, important in terms of feeding all those economically important species out there, and what do we know about how they're um, responding to those events. Um, the next one is the abalone piece, and um, as part of that, um, we know some things. Uh, we know we're in the northern end of the range of red abalone. We know that they are suffering from um, high levels of stress. Uh, uh, we think it's due to warmer waters, but we don't know for sure because the research hasn't been done. So 
Um, part of this is to develop the plan and identify those research and monitoring needs. And as I said before, um, it would be to, um, for us to look at fun how we could support their research and monitoring um, actions. Um, Project five comes out of our science summit. So this was building the line, we have a line off of Newport. This would be adding um, more lines. And I think we partially built a second one, uh, but it's not fully built out. Uh, but the idea is to have five lines uh, all the way in the north coast, south coast, in between Newport and those two, uh, so that we can begin to hone in on where the prob real problems areas are, problem areas <coughs> are. Um, along our coast and it would collect uh, all sorts of information and this uh, price tag is a real price tag based on the discussions at the science summit so i took um, the, the build out of those uh, um, at about a, a quarter of a million dollars per line to um, collect all the data that we're currently collecting on the newport line and then the last one was the how do we begin to raise awareness about our oceans uh, and what um, uh, the broader public can do um, in terms of helping with um, the, the conditions that are uh, happening out there uh, and our marine resources. And it's, you know, sort of a public awareness, mm -hmm. public education campaign. And it would be a multi-medium um, campaign envisioned uh, with that. Six and one somewhat related yes in that there have there were pictures shared at the fisherman's retreat of anomalies and they're the only ones that know it's an anomaly i mean if i'm the first time i've ever gone out fishing and i see a big streak of line that's orange and black and wonder why oregon state was out there <laughs> causing this change in the ocean i would have thought it was just oregon state playing around right oh. Uh, the fisherman noticed it repeatedly at the, and our chair actually saw it when yes. she went out fishing one yep. time um, and they have been trying to figure out exactly what that is and what the organisms that caused it because it was pretty strikingly different from what they've seen. And then the last year also that little two wheel or whatever it is called um, yeah. that's bright orange. Pyrosomes. Thank yeah, you. The pyrosomes showed up yeah. that we had never, they had yeah, never right. seen them in those numbers and they right. actually, Huge it was numbers. a Philippine fisherman <laughs> who said, oh yeah, we eat those in the Philippines all the time. This is what they look like and this is what we do with them. And it was kind of like, but if, you have, if you're only going out on an occasional boating trip to go salmon fishing or whatever, you don't make those observations. And it's really hard to explain that to the public. But if we do have a repository, and that's what the fishermen kept saying, of those kinds of things that take their attention, they're out there every day, right. and this one shocks them, then we're going to say this is something that may be aligned with what's happening in our ocean that's unique. Right. Um, well, I looking at this it seems to me that there's there's really a lot of overlap between yep. number one and number three mm -hmm. that's true too that, that that we might be better off looking at how we might be able to merge those two and then i think we need to give a lot more thought to um to the mechanism of developing some sort of informational portal uh, this this came up briefly at uh one of the old coin uh, discussions here recently, and and nobody there could come up with a a handy vehicle for doing this mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting essentially real time information into a system where that real timeness of it is is really important. <coughs> uh, so I think a lot of thought needs to be given mm -hmm. to what kind of mechanism might work. And, and possibly for, for both of these related. I, I will only say that one and three are also really different <coughs> because the fishermen would say one has more to do with ocean temperatures because that's what they take a lot of right. action in. And that may or may not have anything to do with OA, uh, OA I mean, uh, hypoxia and or, uh, though it seems to be pretty connected to hypoxia, it doesn't necessarily to ocean acidification. Right, but when we read number three, that's true. the first first sentence or two doesn't really relate to OAH at that's all. That's true. It's, You're it's right. unusual <laughs> That's true. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I had a question. I know that um, several years ago there was a West Coast Governors Alliance data portal that was created for the, for the whole West Coast. 
And I, I would like to know, is that a mechanism that might be available as an entry point for <coughs> organizing information and making it more publicly available? And I think yeah, so this, this is, you know, creating a mapping tool for fishers to be able to put their information in. It could be housed anywhere. So this just, there's a pot of money here. We would contract or put out an RFP or go talk to entities that are already housing. Yeah. Um, or possibly through OQUIN again, it might be. Right, or Andy's, the, the Oregon Atlas, Ocean Atlas. I mean, there's, so there's a number of already possible repositories or hosts for where we might put this. I see. Yeah, because it, we talked in the number three about the data portal, and I was just wondering, right. since that had been a big push to get coordinated information on the whole list. The fishermen were clear about wanting it to be simple. Right. <laughs> and Got and it. I right. can just send the stuff off. I don't have to worry it anymore. It was interesting to me. It's yours now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the fishermen now Here's who I am, yeah. if you want to contact me. But the reality yeah. is, I'm going on. I'm fishing. Right. It looked weird. I took a picture or I wrote something down. I'll send it to whoever you want me to send it to. Right. Uh, but make it simple and <coughs> one stop. So. Right. And most of the fishermen these days have computers on board. <laughs> They're doing they it all can the time. just go on the <laughs> website or wherever it is, who they are, where they mm -hmm. are, what they're seeing, whatever data they've got about that, and put it in there. They can load a picture on. I mean, there's so there's some. I think some relatively simple ways to right. set that up. Andy, I don't know if you want to jump in here and talk about the West Coast data. I'd be happy to help answer any questions you may have. And for the record, my name is Andy Lanier. I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, on the, the, the last point that you brought up, I think some of like one of the challenges is that they may be out of outside of communication range. Right. And so there may need to be capacity developed for collecting information and storing it that then gets synced when they're back ashore. Um, so it's not as simple as just having a, a web accessible tool. You might have to have some sort of software design that allows capturing that at sea that's synced ashore later on. And you do need to think about long-term maintenance, storage, uh, hosting of whatever the system is that's going to host that information over time. And I would ask the question, what's the right entity for doing so? You know, there's a um, Bill Honchumaker's lab at Hatfield Marine Science Center focuses on a lot of those kind of unusual, unique observations. <laughs> And maybe an entity like that would be well received by the fishing community. Okay. Speaking as a steward of the West Coast Ocean Data Portal, um, our goal has been to facilitate the discovery of connectivity to and the kind of analysis capabilities of information on the West Coast. But we don't generally produce the data. We're just uh, better organizing how that information is synthesized and stored and accessed. So uh, this is something that certainly could be uh, tied in to the West Coast Ocean Data Portal through a recognition of the fact that the data exists and here's where you would go to get it and here's what it can tell you. Mm -hmm. But that the work to produce the data and to store it in a system like this, that happens kind of on our end separate from this other larger data uh, retrievals system. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, and then I think there's the other question of who's who's actually going to read read the fisherman's report. So if there's somebody that is, it sounds like there might be a lab that is trying to look at these unusual events that could actually use this information. Um, but it's, I don't know. You, you want to have somebody yeah. monitoring that. Okay. You know, there's um, and there is a system out there, I think that Jim looked at it, the name of it is, it's a citizen science application for mm -hmm. recording observations. And then there's a group of scientists, that, I think it's iNaturalist, oh, right. that yeah. actually reviews the observations and says, oh, well, that organism is this Latin name that 
I can't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, there, there is a peer review part of that process because unless there's somebody kind of looking at the stream of information coming in, then you, know, you have to ask the question, what's the real value in producing it? I mean, just so the scientists want the, this information as well. It's not just the fishermen who are interested in the unusual observations. The scientists who want to know about unusual events that are happening, particularly in areas where they're doing research. Um, you know, if something's going on out there and they've got a research project out there or we've got data sets that are saying some weird event, you know, the, the temperature spike that happened last, last summer, I think the one day temperature spike, I mean, it was like 10 degrees or something. So you would expect to see some unusual events there. And so being able to connect that with the spike in temperature um, would be really useful to, to scientists. So, so you want both the fishermen and the scientists to be able to look at that information. Other thoughts on any of these? Well, I, for one, appreciate you putting it all together. Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think you know, if we're going to start thought. talking to funders about things right. that it, the agree. idea was get some early projects identified and um, try to think about what the cost might be. And I don't know, Andy, whether $50,000 is in the ballpark for a mapping tool for this, but based on something you said at the last meeting, you led me to believe that it might be so. And I will talk to... Um, Shelby about, uh, or Sarah, about two and three in terms of what the actual cost might be as that work continues. The uh, conservation plan is based on the budget that ODFW put together to develop the plan and do the monitoring research. So the portion that we might fund would probably be something less than the amount that's there. And then, um, as I said, with Project 5, that came out of the work from the Science Summit, and I just put $100,000 for the raising awareness campaign, it might be more or less depending on what all we're interested in doing there, so. I have a question about Project 6. Are there other entities that are already doing this kind of awareness in Oregon? Yeah, so Surfrider does a bunch of this, um, and uh, they're coastal organizations. Um, the um, Oregon, Shores. Oregon Shores, thank you, I couldn't come up with that. Uh, so there are some. Um, and it is one of the five major recommendations that the OAH panel is, is making as well. Right. Okay. So I think that what we would do would be very focused on the state's efforts as opposed to the broader conservation community may have another message. This would Correct. focus on state priorities yeah. and right. what state activities are mm -hmm. doing. Right. Yeah. Relevant to our mission. Right. That's helpful. And we, and yeah, I also really appreciate you putting this together, Luis. Um, and I think um, maybe subsequently I might have some recommendations. We don't have to go through them right now, but as you said on Project 4, we're not funding the state's conservation right. fisheries management plan, and it definitely reads that way now, and there's some right. simple fixes we could do to put the emphasis on the research and monitoring component. Right. And again, I think that citizen science um, data portal could be relevant in this one as well because uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has a whole host of commercial divers that they work with that have been right. willing to do data observations, so that could uh, dovetail in. So how we can cross-reference those um, really simply if we, um, you know, had this sheet and I don't know, even had like keywords to help tie together some of the major themes, whether it's education, citizen science, research and monitoring, um, ocean acidification, just tying back for the legislature too to see that we really are putting forth the funding priorities that we said that we were going to do. We're not off off in the weeds here. This is this is consistent with what we said we were gonna do. So tying that together. And, and thoughtfully, maybe even key people who could answer more questions in depth about what each of these would do. So we know that there are key people uh, in each of these, scientists and others, who know more about what those are. 
key fishermen who were involved in those fishermen conversations. If we had in that same thing you were just saying, a list of those kinds of people who if people have real quick questions when you're talking about them, well, talk to so-and-so. They can give you a little bit more information about what we're trying to do here. That kind of thing would be helpful down the road if we're going to talk. Well, back on, on number three, again, um, I keep reading this, this description, and it seems to me that we could eliminate the term ocean acidification in the title because there's really no reference to it in any of the, the description below it. These are, are really just unusual events. And again, I think that it seems to me that there, there might be a simple way of tying one and three, and three together into a single, you know, maybe, maybe de-emphasizing the term mapping tool on the first one and just get rid of the mapping, um, unless that was something that was specifically recommended. But, but I think it could be left a little bit more general in terms of how the data could be handled and, and, uh, and made available other than just in a mapping tool. I think my one of the possible advantages of, to having them separate but related would be that the broader, what I kind of call more of a data portal than a mapping tool, the broader data portal is a smaller, more fundable project. It might gain some traction with um, some of the industry-related um, funding sources, whereas the bigger project might be a big leap for some. So if there's some way to um, stack it rather than you know combine so that there's some levels of option there, but I agree that they definitely should be linked in that way. Yeah, f for me, three goes beyond just um, because sorry. there's information about examining the contents of the fish mm -hmm. that are caught and using log books to mm -hmm. um, record. So there's there's a little bit more here than just trying to connect unusual events with what's going on with forage event, forage fish. This would so, be a great yeah. example of what we're trying to do. Whereas if you can get like ban and submarine cable to put in twenty five thousand to do the data portal part, and then you get you know the um, conservation organization for part of it and the state for part of it. So you're kind of building it in layers. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, everybody gets their piece. Yeah, and I really like actually the idea of connecting them but keeping them separate because I think mm -hmm. um, the first project is definitely an opportunity for to engage the uh, fisher persons into, you know, collecting data and having a place to put it in a really easy vehicle. And that is something that, um, well, someone who's very technologically astute could put something like that together, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, so that you can feed data into it. It could be a, a subset of mm -hmm. number three because yeah. I think there's some real value in in using the kind of information that's coming from number one mm -hmm. to um, to track unusual events. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's where a lot of the information. Right. Yeah, thank you for, for putting these summaries together. And so my question is, in terms of next steps, do we uh, do we need to add a little bit more information to each of these to, because I know uh, this is condensed from a lot of right. information that we already have so right. that we could look at it on a two-pager. But on the other hand, you know, Senator Roblin's point about um, having a little bit more information here, is there a need to do I can it, certainly add a, uh, for more information, contact. So and so. Yeah. Um. Are, are these being treated as RFPs? They could be. Or yeah, not be. yet. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. At some point. Yeah. If, if no, I was just thinking, you know, Emily, yeah, I think so. at the last meeting talked about, you know, it, it's hard to have. Uh, conversations with foundations in the abstract and having um, some specific projects mm -hmm. to actually say here are some things that we think are priorities for funding mm -hmm. are any of these 
yeah. fit within your priorities and uh, can we have a conversation about what that might look like? You know, I've ha mm -hmm. had ongoing conversation with Packard Foundation. So mm -hmm. here's now some specific projects that we might yeah. talk to Packard Foundation about funding. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other foundations, the same thing. More so. information for potential funders. Yeah, I mean, if, if a foundation, foundation wanted less, it, we'd have to develop a full blown proposal. Yeah, if we were going to put out an RFP, we'd have to have a lot more detailed information yes. about exactly yeah. what it is we're looking for. I was just trying to get some general descriptions right, right. of things that we th think are important to, yeah. to, to yeah. tackle that, early on. And that have risen to the to That the ha power. have been discussed in right. other places that are clearly priorities, mm -hmm. whether it's our science summit or the, the fisherman scientists roundtable or yep. our own conversation. So. Please remind me where we landed last time about um, funding the potential monitoring gap for the reserves. Remember the 20. Yes, yeah, so, I, so yeah. I did not put it on here because I was looking at this as being sort of a more immediate okay. need. Uh, so the dead, so the first is uh, the deadline is 2023 to get the first uh, the assessment done. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about this in turn in the context of uh, the next year or two. Okay. Uh, so it's not on here, but it's certainly one of those things that I've got flagged okay. uh, in terms of there's need, and I know uh, the stack folks are talking about that, and okay. I'm trying to identify um, sources of funding, and uh, there's always the chance that the legislature might change its mind that they actually need to provide some money money for the assessment work, even though uh, originally they said they wouldn't, right. um, <laughs> because what's going to happen is ODFW is going to stop doing the monitoring right. in order to do, uh, use that budget to do the assessment work, so you're going to lose a couple years of monitoring as a result of that, and is that really a good thing? So there may be some conversation with the legislature about, yep. here's the choice you're making us make, and is that really what you want us to do? So I, so. It's, okay. it's there. I, I could add it here. It, I, I mean, I, I suppose there's no harm in having it on here. It's something that we're aware of and that uh, certainly needs to be funded. Mm -hmm. And it's something that um, Shelby and I have talked about, you know, and she's been here and talked with us about what role OOS could pay, play as sort of the coordinating body for getting that done. Mm -hmm. The statute requires that a public university is actually going to do the mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. So who puts out the RFP? To, to respond, um, you know, uh, most of STAC is university folks, so there's a little conflict of interest mm -hmm. with them right. uh, running that process, so it's something that we could do uh, when the time comes. So I, how do folks feel? Do they want, I, it's easy enough to add that to this list, so it's there front and center? I, I would personally say it's nice to have on with the timeline that says this doesn't need to happen until 2023. However, well, the work has to has to be done before 2023. Yeah. That's what. <laughs> right. it, yeah, I mean that's what we were yeah. saying. That, yeah. that we have some time, but we need to get at it. Okay. Uh, as opposed to these could be happening tomorrow. I mean, I think that's the only distinction. It is a state priority, so yeah, right. it definitely. So I I would encourage adding it. Okay. It's also just a recognition that right. we are yep. thinking about marine reserves and. Any other thoughts about what you might add to this to make it more useful? So I'll add a seventh project, which is the Marine Reserve Assessment work. Um, I'll add a spot at the end of each one or under the project name that says for more information, contact and figure out who the contacts are for those. Um, make sure those contacts are willing to be contacted That's about right. them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll connect one and three in some way um sure and i can i can try a quick rewrite on those okay that would be I'll great jim all right uh and we probably should add uh andy's comment about the fact that it's not just a mapping tool but we're probably gonna have to have software in addition to the mapping tool so that they can enter real time and sync to uh, the mapping tool later on 
when they get back to uh, shore. It would be nice to add some more context around Project 6. So I don't know if it's talking to, you said it's not necessarily focused on conservation interests, but more on state efforts and state priorities, but talking to some groups about what that would actually look like, like what they're seeing, and what do we want the public to know and to act, how do we want them to act differently if they're not acting the way we want? You know, what is it that we're really trying to do? Except okay. Who do you think is the person, is that surf rider that we should talk to? Yeah, I think Charlie can help with that okay. because they've been having conversations all up and down the coast about mm -hmm. um, issues and um, <coughs> have been hosting forums. And yeah. so um, they might be helpful along with Oregon Shores Coalition. And okay. so there are a couple of folks I can talk to some of that come out of the task force also, Jim? Yes. So there'll be some recommendations to right. exactly. tied to. Yeah. Tied specifically to OAH, yeah. We'll, we'll okay. Right. Because Charlie and all of them are working hard on the beach bill kind of mm -hmm. anniversary stuff too. To try to right. Great opportunity <coughs> to raise awareness. Right. Uh, yeah, August uh, 22nd, 23rd. August 22nd, 23rd. Is there an opportunity for you to present any of this to them? Is there a spot on the agenda? So it, there's not at this one. I was on a panel at last year's. Uh, no. Year you were in Portland the year before right. uh, where we talked about some of this. Uh, and given the subjects this year, it's probably not. Um, ripe it's because it's so specifically focused on carbon mm -hmm. so I can talk to um, the staff for the conference about next summers and whether there's an opportunity to talk about this some some you know it's you want it to be real when you go talk about it sure so um, well given that several of these have definite economic right impacts right you know, for our So yeah, Louise. So do we want? Do you want us to start shopping these around? Yeah. So let me take another okay. crack at it. So Jim's gonna uh, work on one and three, and I'll work on the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And let me take another crack at it, and then I think uh, we can start mm -hmm. using do, it. Do we want to fold this into the one pager mm -hmm. when we get it? Is yeah. that the idea that we have this kind of template that has what the who the host is and who it is, and then this drops in there? Yeah. Okay. I think so. I think that would be so great. Let's, Email your file. It's it's in Word, right? Yes. So, so you, much easier for me to. So you should have it as an attachment when the oh, agenda. That's, so that's you right. should have it. Okay. So if anybody has ed other edits, just go ahead and edit it on that document. And send them to me, and sure. I'll uh, okay. I'll uh, work on that. Anything else on pilot projects? No, but it, I would say if anybody's interested in attending the Coastal Parks Economic Summit in Lincoln City, uh, to hold either of our offices. We need I have not yet registered. Okay. But you're on the invite list. Not everybody here would automatically be on the invite list. Yeah, I wasn't on the invite list. Yeah, so it's been, uh, there's sort of a set invite list that's every true. year, so. Okay. <laughs> but I'll call Rosie. Pardon? I'll call Rosie. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, I would say call Senator Roblin's office if you're interested, because Rosie's got all the information in terms of. I'm okay with you, Rosie. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know if you're going more of it. I had it on my calendar. Okay. I haven't registered yet. I think I should go, yeah. yeah. She doesn't have far to go. Right. Right. Neither of us do, so. All right. Uh, let's take a break. Let's come back at uh, 10 minutes to 11. Yes. So they just get attacked. And yeah, just a cloud of and it, they bite you. They don't. Yeah. They're not. They're not. 
So, so Andy, we get disconnected yeah. from our call earlier? This fit me through my jeans. Yeah. And I don't know what happened. It's right here on okay. my chest. But it looked like it was still going. Well, it, I, yeah, but she was saying that it didn't got me right here. dial in, which I've had it before where I've dialed in, and it goes to somebody else's office. Office. Uh, So I just uh, hung up and re-dialed. Yeah, yeah, I think they probably they are hung nasty up. Little I got to back in. I was you, you I don't okay. think he called. Yeah, just too busy. When I asked him to identify them, they identified them. So I had trips to France and my trips to this and my trips to Well, let me tell you about my trip down the Danube. We... Oh, that'd be cool. We took a vacation, first time in four years. Yeah, we went to Orlando. A, a luxury tour, a luxury boat cruise. And you know, wonderful suite, with a balcony overlooking the water, great service, great food, all the booze you can drink. And two days into it, they announced the water levels are too low and they're changing us over to buses. <laughs> oh, no. But the bus did have a picture on the side of it of the luxury cruise line. Okay. <laughs> That's sad. So instead of sitting on the top deck with a margarita, I'm sitting at a bus uh, bumming change to use the porta pot or the the bus <laughs> the, the bathrooms and the bus stops. <laughs> we were not happy. That was sad. That was really sad. So how's Caddy doing? Um, uptight and working really hard. You know, trying to fundraise and get stuff going. But I think she's more. She's doing everything she needs to do. Yeah, she's getting out the door more. I met Tiffany Tiffany Mitchell um, last week. For money, or just to say hello. Um, I think it was a little bit of. Was, I think it was a little bit of both, but I think it was mostly to get to know. Say, yeah. I want to know the coast of Congress and I need to get to know. Well, that's that's a good thing. I agree. Um, <coughs> now I go. We were invited by the Tillamook Democrats to come and get their endorsement, and I'm saying, you know, I was nominated by Tillamook Democrats. Right. So coming and asking for the endorsement of the party is uh, a, little, a little ridiculous. A little odd, but, but I understand, you know, I'm not naive, I understand the subtleties here. You're looking at nonpartisan races for county commissioner, and you're unhappy with some legislators and congressmen. Right. And I said, I gotta tell you, when we get back there in January, we're gonna need every Democrat we can find if you're interested in tax reform, education, or health care. Right. And, uh, and I talked to Tiffany afterwards, and I said, you know, the eyes are lurching to the right, We've got to resist the temptation to lurch to the left because if we pick up the center, we go to the center, we're going to win. I agree. And she says, all of my polling is telling me that. But my problem is that in my, how I got elected. Yeah, yeah, in my voters pamphlet, I say we need a strong progressive voice for, uh, for the North Coast. And now, now you got to recast that. You don't have one. But, but yeah. Well, I mean, the best thing we've got going up there is that the Republican candidate is even worse. But, no, yeah. but you know that they could. Uh, oh, it's like Caddy's race. I mean, uh, it's our voters. I mean, you know, she, her polling is saying the same thing. Yeah. It was not about the extreme right or left. It was, yeah. Well, Caddy's well, Caddy's in the middle. Yes, but, but they're casting her down. <coughs> yeah. They're always going to do that. Uh, yeah. Have a vocal support right. the liberals. Ar Arnie does that. Gombert does yeah, that. Caddy does that. that. Yeah, that's how we get twenty-one million dollars for Hatfield, and three million dollars exactly. for Wave Energy, that's and new different. highways. <laughs> and yeah, but they don't want to hear about that. So they want to hear other now in our areas, good for Caddy. I think people are shocked. That we keep telling them they really like LNG projects. Yeah, yeah. Coast. yeah. yeah. well, I'm, I'm getting squeezed on that, as you can imagine. They should go and look at what's happening in Alberta. More progressive than Portland liberals. Yeah. And they're putting in natural gas. And they're trying to make sure that people understand they're making the cleanest okay. natural gas in the world, the cleanest oil in the world. And did you want them to all buy it from those other places that are destroying the world? <laughs> you, you want to come from us? You would have loved the, the Tillamook group because they sent me this questionnaire. You know, uh, um, um, are you a Democrat in good standing? What do you think of the of the party platform? Which planks are you most passionate about? And which one are any races? Yeah, well, that's probably. I said to him that, that Hillary lost, that you lost, and I lost. And my question to them is, you endorsed me. What are you going to do to help me get elected? Right. Yeah, who's going to come off that? They were here.
Okay, if we can get everybody to uh, take their seats. Okay, um, we're going to get started here. Uh, so next on the agenda is public comment. So anybody who's sitting in the room want to comment, and then I'll go to the phone in case there are folks there who want to comment. Okay, so nobody there. Oh, how, how about on what? the oops? Yeah. Sarah, Sarah, come on. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, I liked what Andy said for the record. Uh, I'm Sarah Colasar from Oregon Sea Grant. Um, I just wanted to follow up on uh, one of the items that Shelby had mentioned at the March 30th meeting, which was the uh, potential for additional funding for the stack uh, assessment process. Uh, so uh, we have been successful and received uh, a grant from the Lazar Foundation. So we will be funding a Sea Grant Natural Resource Policy Fellow uh, to assist with uh, that process. Excuse me, um, decisions for that fellowship should be happening any day now. Um, and the expectation is that person would begin working uh, sometime in the early fall, September, October. Good. Sarah, what do you anticipate that person doing? Uh, helping to facilitate the uh, process for what the assessment will look like so not actually doing any of the assessment but the planning the design um, right. I think Deanna said it as that person would be wrangling the chickens and making sure that all of the pieces are in place um, for what what the assessment will look like from stacks perspective okay. yes yes sorry for the marine reserves process is that a one-year it is a one-year fellowship but full time, so basically, it would give Stack that full time uh, person to help plan the process. Yeah, great. So, thanks. Sarah. That's all I've got. All right. Okay, anybody on the phone? I think it's Gina Hart of Nature Hi, Gina. Hey. Um, so I just wanted to bring up that, um, that there is a, I'm listening to a list of pilot projects, and I just wanted to bring up that there's a diverse set of needs and stakeholders that are interested in the Oregon Ocean. And um, similarly, there are many agencies that are working to regulate and support the oceans. And the list that was proposed, I feel like just represents one stakeholder group, primarily commercial fishermen and just one agency. So I hope that either now or in the future that OS will you know, broaden your scope to incorporate other potential funders and partners, whether it's recreational fishermen, those interested in water quality, conservation, uh, setting and offshore development, or many other issues. So yeah, so this is a point I just want to, I brought it up in the past, but I just want to bring it up again for the record. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. That's a good reminder. writing so I just <coughs> okay anybody else on the phone who wants to comment uh, yes this is Charlie Wyden with Surfer Foundation hi Charlie hi um, well first I apologize I uh, don't have more to respond to with respect to the project discussion that was had. Uh, I wasn't able to view those online, so I, 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 I tracked as best I could the discussion, but I just want to second um, what Gina brought up and that there is a pretty broad interest of users with uh, Oregon's ocean, uh, and I encourage the group to really dive deep on the types of issues and fundable opportunities 
that may overlap with the current interests, but maybe a little bit more broadened to represent um, other users, particularly recreational users, uh, who spend a lot of time in the ocean. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Anyone else on the phone? Okay, thanks. Uh, so next up, um, after our discussion at the last meeting, I went back and edited both the draft budget and the draft staff position description. In terms of the budget, I didn't um, do a whole lot, but what I did do was to, um, on uh, the revenue section, just clarified grants are anticipated to be both federal and private. I didn't try and divide that number in between federal and private, but just to clarify that that's what we were talking about. I increased the state appropriation to a million dollars since that's the request that we have in uh, with the legislature, and I decreased the major donor and small donors because I think, um, I think it was Emily that pointed out we had probably overreached in terms of a startup organization thinking it was gonna get a big chunk of money from uh, major donors and small donors uh, and even business donors uh, given that we're just getting started. Um, so I did um, decrease those amounts um, and uh, increase the state appropriation. I did not change anything in terms of the expenditure side uh, based on our conversation. And I don't know if folks have further thoughts at this point. No, just clearing up that, that little uh, wording problem under monitoring and research RFPs, if we could word that. Yeah, I think R probably I should just put projects. Or RFPs yeah. for monitoring, RFPs for research. Yeah, I think if I just change it to okay. monitoring projects and research projects, okay. that'll clarify that. Anything else on budget? Okay, then on the position description, I took, um, I, I did a couple things. One, uh, I pulled a couple of the, what were really desired skills or attributes out of the minimum qualification section and put them into a separate desired skills uh, section. And then I added, in the compensation, I added a salary range and a contractor range. Uh, I don't know whether those numbers are real, but I tried to separate, at least put some numbers there in terms of what the cost might be if we were paying somebody part-time. And I'm, this is based on a half-time FTE, um, what we would pay on an annual basis for a salary, that's not the total cost of a half-time person, but the salary range uh, based on somebody's experience and then a range if we were going with a contractor instead of a, uh, a salary position. And so then the salary position would be an employee of the state? Yes. Okay. And that's already worked out that that's possible? Oh, we, we'd have to get a budget Okay, but I mean that the, the, the structure exists that we could have, that Oost could have an employee. And a state, state employee. A state employee could be. I think Oost has to have a state employee. If we're going to have an employee, I think it's Right, I'm just saying that we, this, the structure exists for Oost to have an employee. Yes. Uh, yeah, so DSL can uh, get a staff person that's okay. assigned to Oost okay. half time, is okay. the way that would work. Okay, they just need the resource budget. for it. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah, they'd have to get a position authorized in the budget and funding for it. Or money for contracted I services. Say, or, yes, because contractors are not necessarily, but we can, they could also do that. We could contract with a person to do the job that's listed above. Right. But it would still be through DSL, through the budget. DSL budget, and they'd still have to get resources to pay for the contract just be done through a different vehicle. But if we 
when we get the million or the five million dollars from the state, <laughs> we could, as a board, say we're going to give this X number of dollars for a contractor and pay it out of that money through right. DSL. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. DSL would just need the limitation in their budget to spend it. Uh, the uh, the one other change that I did do is uh, there used to be a requirement for a degree in the minimum qualifications, and I just changed it to a working knowledge of marine science or a related field and got rid of, I think it was a degree or mm -hmm. a, a marine sciences or a related field before, and so just changed that out to make it a little more. So we could hire a fisherman? General. We could. Okay. Most of them have degrees. <laughs> I was say, most of, them have of some sort, yes. <laughs> Anything else on that, that folks want to see? So, do you want a motion to? Adopt I, I don't think so at this point. I, you know, we don't have funding yet. So, when we make a request, mm -hmm. when we're going to make a request, we come back and get approval to actually make the request and then we do that okay. we're just getting prepared yes <laughs> for the opportunity we're to make trying to yes set the table set the table Thank you so for your work on this. Yeah. moving back a few steps yep back to the budget I was yep. just looking at the grant program and sort of based on Gina and Charlie's comments and just thinking about maybe communications grants or things that are sort of beyond monitoring and research is there, I mean, I know this is not set in stone, but we have these, you know, just a small grant program at 100,000, and then everything else is in monitoring and research, and there may be opportunities that are beyond monitoring and research that we might want to fund. So I guess it's just to note that this isn't really set in stone. I wanted right. to highlight that, you know, there may be large ticket items that come up that we would want to fund that aren't quite in that. So we could Pigeon add board. an outreach yeah. and education yeah. uh, project yeah. category. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? But I think these, these two terms, monitoring and research, are pretty broad. You know, we can include a lot of mm -hmm. right. things under research, for example. Yeah, but I think an, uh, an awareness campaign is something different. And so I think probably doing an, had, adding an O&E category mm -hmm. um, Makes a lot of sense. Oh, I see what you're saying. On the budget. Under the grant program. Gotcha. I'd add, under monitoring and right. research, I'd add outreach and education which projects. Which we need to have project six anyway. Yeah, I was really going to say we've about. got project six, which is $100,000. Right. Instead of small grants, would that make sense to do that? Yeah, I guess I'm just sort of highlighting that potentially that could be larger than hundred thousand yes, dollars if something really compelling right. you know comes along and so we don't want to be beholden to saying well we only budgeted a hundred grand for things outside of monitoring and research would it be better to just combine all three of these yeah well that's what I was just gonna yeah. say is just have a, and a million and a half and dollar and pot yeah. each year to Tell fund about projects projects mm -hmm. monitoring research outreach and education projects and yep. leave it at that yeah. Yeah. okay that makes sense and then I don't know if this makes sense given project number one, but it sounds like you know there's other users in the marine environment that might want to do citizen science. So could this software be open to recreational fishermen, surfers, people that are out that do have an intimate knowledge with the ocean that yep. see an anomaly? Yep. Both for viewing and for putting input, I think yeah. yes, it should okay. be. So maybe we could refine that language to just be a little more inclusive. Yep. And I think that goes for yeah. actually just kind of the, the tone of all of it, making sure that we are um, kind of in that multi-client <laughs> frame of mind as we're seeking yeah. funds. Right. We want to make sure there's, you know, something that everybody can attach to. So I think that will happen in another draft of this, given we can yep. submit comments individually to Luis for okay. that. Okay, any other thoughts on any of these? So, just a clarification, 
I understand that um, payroll is, for example, the half-time person at DSL, uh, but then we have the rent, insurance, all those items. Are those to then help DSL offset their day-to-day -day costs related to this program? Yeah, so this anticipated that at some point we might be a 501c3 and have our own office and staff. and. So I was just uh, trying to build around, and uh, while DSL doesn't pay rent because they're in their own building, they might charge oost. <laughs> if we're gonna That's house a staff wondering. person here, there might be a, a rent charge like they charge all the other agencies who are on the second and third floor here. Um, so just trying to factor in potential cost. It may, it, these may be budget high if we're just going to have a half-time staff person who's going to be housed at DSL. Okay. And then or they might be housed at their home on the coast, so That's there right. might be rent and, or a small office on the coast. Uh, so there might be rent and utilities associated with that. Got it. And um, are there board trust member expenses? So the travel is, is, is uh, you know, I tried to assume that, part? yeah. Okay to pay the per diems and the yeah. uh, mileage and parking and. Okay, so it's not just for, because it, right. I just thought this might be for the position itself. No, it's for the trust in total. Trust in total, okay. And, and once we have some money in the, the Ocean Science Fund, uh, DSL will be able to, to use, uh, I think, up to 5% of that to help recoup these costs. Uh, right. We're sort of yeah. um, absorbing at the moment. Right. And we do appreciate it. Yeah, we do. And, uh, and I can tell you, uh, knowing what it costs per hour to, to have DOJ uh, do yes. their work, uh, and there was more than one attorney who worked on this uh, for us, So, and DSL is absorbing that cost, which was sort of above and beyond what they were anticipating. So there's no coffee here in uh, right. pastries <laughs> this morning to save money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of Matt's right. time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, anything else uh, for the good of the order today? So we already have our next meeting scheduled for uh, October 19th, uh, back here in the land board uh, room at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, potential topics. So one of the things we talked about is having somebody from Parks or the Parks Foundation come talk to us about that model. Mm -hmm. We want both Parks and, and, the, foundation. and the Foundation. I think it would be interesting. Well, the director would serve as both, but because he's, she no, is I'm, on. No, so I'm thinking the uh, oh, oh, a different Community Foundation. Oregon Community Foundation. Do we want them or not at that time? Uh, probably no. not. OK, I agree. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um, also, we should maybe have an update on legislative concepts because mm -hmm. we should have had them by then. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Emily's in my terms expire. Oh, so October December. land board uh, will need to do. We have two people who are two or three who are appointed to three year two. I think two of us on three-year contracts. Okay, so the land board would need to do reappointments, assuming Emily and Jim want to continue. Or assuming you want us to continue. <laughs> it's not my decision. That's the land board's decision, but. <laughs> we would like to put forward that the land board do reappoint you, if you wanted to be reappointed. Yeah. I think we could do that. Yeah. So we just need to remember to do that the October land board meeting, I think, or the December land board meeting. I can't, well, the, yeah, we were appointed in an October meeting, so I think the terms expire in October. Let's key it up on both sides. Yeah, I agree. 19th is our next meeting here. Yeah, the land board is probably the week October before. October or October, it's the Tuesday before that, yeah. 17th. I think it is, it might be that week. It's a, it is. I okay. Think the terms expire or in December. We were appointed Terms started in December, but I, 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 I actually have the land board item when we're where they did that. So let me go <coughs> here. The, the October land board is uh, October 16th. Okay. And our next meeting here is October 19th. So we can have a celebratory party if they've already of course, <laughs> taken that. There you go. Um, just for clarification, again on the timeline of. 
the required legislative fix for engaging the charitable September. donations. September. Would that be when it would be? That's when we have uh, to request. That's when we request it. When, if everything went well for December. us. December. It would be December we would have authority at that point. No, no. December we would have the actual bill that's going to come bill. out. And so then depending would. on how it moves through the process, mm -hmm. the authority would be granted six months after the legislative session is over. Meaning what? Almost uh, January of the following year. January. Takes almost a year. So instead of January of now, unless we put a emergency could, clause Could you on. justify an emergency we clause in this case? Then so it would be which, like 90 then days it would be after the end of the session. So yours can have an emergency clause. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> they're having conversation about it. would be what's 90 days after the uh, October 1st. July, August, so September. by next Assuming October. They're out on time. Correct. So in the meantime, um, and I'm just kind of maybe speaking out loud here, but I'm trying to think of uh, particularly this list of projects and how quickly we need to get this revised and ready, but it seems like we've got some serious hangups. But if we did receive um, even state so we can, funding, we, we, we can, would still be. Out. We can receive money anytime as mm -hmm. long as it goes to the state treasurer. So okay. we, we have the ability to do the money. If we want to have money coming from down other people who want to take a tax break, then it's it's seriously yeah, yeah. another year. Almost. So in terms of getting this one pager and list of projects available to shop, you can have those conversations early and often, I suppose, is probably a good rule of thumb there. Um, but uh, perhaps we should have an opportunity to like, maybe, I don't know, formally or informally finalize this list in October. I don't know if we should be, might be presumptuous to, it, it's mm -hmm. see, there's still a little bit of roughness to it. I think right. we've got some good structure here, but a couple of comments from public comment on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, so we probably should not go too far out there until we have a, another right. opportunity convened with another opportunity for public comment and make sure this gets out in advance of that so that those partners can review it. Okay, right. yep. so um, we got Parks Foundation update of uh, legislative concepts. Uh, bring back the revised project list for further review. Uh, anything else? At some point, it would be good to have um, Karen and uh, Francis come back in and just give us an update on what we know from yeah. the latest information. It might also be good that if they got a copy of these projects in advance, if they could comment on them, because we might get some more. So they both participated in most of the discussion right. of exactly. these. So, <laughs> but yeah, and there is. Right. These projects. Right. There might be some reword. Once we get the final. Oh, so we should have the OAH report. Right. What about. Yeah, I think we'll have a good working version in a couple of weeks. Right. It may not be the very final version. But by the October meeting, you'll have a final oh, by, by document. The, yeah. It has yeah. to be in by September. Okay. Yeah. What about inviting. Ocean funders to present on their sort of strategic plan strategy for what they want to see. If it can be done in a delicate way, I know there's just a I know there's a consortium of, of private foundations that are working in Oregon and along the West Coast. I'd be curious to see where their strategy is right now, and we could get some ideas on what direction they want to head and potentially find some synergies. Like yeah, a panel of private funders. Yeah, like a panel of private funders. And I do anticipate another issue that will come up in this session is offshore drilling. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we've got that issue. And I know they just had an NCSL meeting I was invited to last weekend. Okay. Down at the NCSL in San Diego. So, um, and we have been having that conversation at the legislature for the last year or so. Um, 
we're pretty clear we don't want it. Right. right. Um, both Democrats and Republicans. It's kind of figuring out that the new conversation is how do we write legislation in our states that impacts all the way out to territorial sea as a, I mean to um, OCS national boundaries as opposed to just the three miles because we have control there, but uh, there might be some other things that could. So I, that may be something you could hear from people about too. Mm -hmm. so, Senator, doesn't the state moratorium end yes. in 2020? Yes, it, it has to get reinstated soon if we're going to have a state moratorium. That's why I'm saying it's, it is timely and we will have that conversation with the legislature in the next, in the next year or so. But I think we have to renew the moratorium at least by the 19 session, 19, 20 yeah. session, one area or the other. But I think it is 21. If that's of interest to this group. Yeah, so Chris, remind me uh, when are LCs available publicly that agencies might have put in related to things that we would be interested in? Some of them are already publicly available because they were discussed at board and commission meetings, right. I suppose. Yeah, I just don't know which ones the governor's office. Final. Has the governor's office already done their process and approved LCs? No. 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 Okay. We've, I've, we, we've received a few of our LCs back from Ledge Council for review, but um, as far as them then go, moving on to, to become bills, that, that process I don't think has been done. Okay. I think they're supposed to have all of theirs close to done by the time the legislature starts putting theirs in. So the September is the time. Uh, I don't think they're out for release necessarily then. They're just supposed to have all of their drafts done. By yeah, so, so there's a process similar right. to the budget process where Correct. they put in Correct. LCs and the governor's office can say yay or nay. But I think if you're already in the drafting process, that means the governor's office has said yes to them. Yeah, at least in the initial. Because generally, you don't spend money to draft unless right. you got the okie dokie <laughs> to do it. Um, I, I okay, I'll, I'll, the, I'll I wouldn't say they're publicly available, though. Yeah, right. That's okay. What I was say that <laughs> just like ours aren't publicly available until after December, and we have decided to true right. December. Mm -hmm. The true public date is when the legislature starts and they're introduced. So that's it. It wouldn't be this that this year's going to be earlier because we're starting earlier. Yeah, I could probably find that information from DAS, though, and send it to the group if you want to know what the dates are. Are you trying to see if it's before your October meeting? Yeah, so, yeah, so <laughs> okay. I'm trying to figure out if by the October meeting we could pull a list of LCs together that agencies are submitting that have an impact on ocean marine resources um, so that we're aware of what's right. being proposed. We won't have the budget stuff by then. But I think probably there should. I I just can't remember the timeline for all seasons. Too, too and long I can't ago. remember when they publicly put them out there. Right. Yeah. Yes, but certainly by now, any of the state agencies uh, that needed their boards or commissions to give them a blessing should right. should be out sure. there and be uh, you know public notes like DSLs were all right. are all on the land boards website you know okay. and the record for that. Okay. And all the state agencies have already submitted their budgets. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, right. They, I think they're due August Their draft first. budgets, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and they have the policy option packages there if there's anything related to marine activities. Yeah, but that doesn't, yes, yeah. But we won't know what's in GRB until November. December mm -hmm. or sometime right. in November before it yeah. gets printed, but yeah, okay. Um, is there a list of natural resource agencies you'd be, you want, would you like us to reach out to, to ask about ocean? Well, the ones that used to be resources. part of the marine cabinet, so DLCD and ODFW and DSL and Parks, who has the Rocky Shore stuff. Um, I think Doug Gammy, uh, in terms of their uh, LIDAR stuff. Um, Seems to me there were six agencies and I'm missing somebody who I can't DLC, come up with. DLC, DLC. Oh, maybe DEQ oh, on the water DLC. quality piece. Okay. Yep. I can, I mean, I could put out a request to their legislative coordinators about 
anything that's ocean related. That would be great yeah. if and you could just do that to the natural resource cabinet yeah. LCs, yeah. that would be great. Yep. Yeah. Just so we have a sense of what's out there. Okay, anything else folks can think about for the next meeting? So assignments in terms of, for instance, the private funders panel or current and Francis update, who's going to, are you going to reach out to them? Yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll chat with Emily about who we might talk to in terms of the private foundations mm -hmm. who have um, ocean initiatives. Um, the OAH report, I'll rely on Jim. Um, the revised project list I'll do based on input. Jim's going to do a little bit. Uh, people are going to send me edits, so I'll sort of be the keeper of that. Um, Chris is going to check about the LCs, and um, we'll know where we are on the uh, concept to um, address uh, our issue with the OCF. I'll talk to uh, Lisa at Parks about she and somebody from the foundation coming to visit with us. And um, I've got offshore drilling with a question mark. We'll see if we've got time on the agenda, but uh, certainly an issue we, we want to pay attention to. And, Lu and Louise, I, I pulled up the uh, 2015. Oh, so they are December terms. Yeah, mm -hmm. they all end on the calendar year. It sounds like um, everyone is, is still interested in Jim and Emily um, serving is that correct? And you're both interested moving forward for a new term. I just want to. As long as you don't mind having somebody pushing eighty by the end of my next term. <laughs> <laughs> we think that's really a nice young age. Yes. Yeah. So if that is the case, then I'll likely we'll try to get something to on the October land board agenda because yeah. December is going to be all things Elliot, I think. And I don't know if you want to be involved. Oh yeah. So no. just just for clarification, my understanding is that this was set up this way so that there would be some overlap in yes term. so now do all the terms become four terms or four years yes yes okay yeah so your appointments would be to four-year terms this next go around I can still walk there. <laughs> no problem okay anything else for the good of the order today all right thanks everybody I yield back 35 right. minutes of your time thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you on the phone. Student success. They're gone.